Today, we are looking at a new construction property surrounded by over 100 successful JWB clients. We are live on Facebook right now for the Thursday edition of the Not Your Average Investor Show, the JWB Rental Legal Property of the Week. Week, 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 week. I am your host, Pablo Gonzalez. With me, as always, the man that I affectionately call GC because he generates cash flow, because he's got genius concepts, because he's a great co host, and because at birth he was named Greg Cohen. Say hello, Greg. Hello, everybody. Great to be with you. And if you've been here before, you know what's coming next. You know that you are in the right place if you want to know about owning rental income properties for long-term wealth. You know you're in the right place for the best property management practices for rental property investors. And you know you're in the right place if you just want this uh, edge in the Jacksonville market area because you're a real estate professional and you want to some extra opportunities for you and your clients. Next place to go is chat with jwb.com. If you're on the call today, the place to go is jwbinventory.com so that you can follow us live as we break down this property that we are about to break down. And right now it is time for the roll call. You ready, GC? Game on. Roll call. Lee Bishop. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Drew Barnhill. Hello, everybody. Alejandro Lopez. Welcome back. Hello. I mean, he puts hell in the uh, in the chat, but I think, oh yeah, he meant hello, everybody. He, he updated that afterwards. Leo from California. Good morning, all. That's right. Lee. And Lee is saying, Alejandro said hell. Yeah, he did. Jennifer Filzen says, hey, hey, JWB family. Greetings from beautiful Monterey, California. Greetings, Jen Filzen. Dean Curry, he's back from Columbus, Ohio. I won't say the rest of his statement because I don't agree with his affinity for the Buckeyes. No offense. Mark Mills, aloha from Hawaii. To you, Lori Day, listening from the 904 Go Jags. There you go. We can get behind that one. Lydia Filzen, mother of Jen Filzen, and amazing fiction author, future guest of the Not Your Average Investor Show, which we really haven't discussed yet, but that's going to happen because she's awesome. Hello, yeah. Lydia Filzen. Welcome back. Her, Francois, from New Jersey, which I like to call, it's the New Jersey, but Florida is the new New Jersey, I feel. And uh, what's up, JWB fam? You know what? I've got, you know, your, your, your theme of continuing to butcher names on the show continues, by the way. It's not Herb. It's Herve. Herve. Is it really? Yeah. Ask him. Herve, how come you haven't told me this? <laughs> <laughs> I've, said, I've butchered your name at least, at least a dozen times. I'm sorry, man. I take, I take real pride. You know, that, that hurts when you say my theme of continuing to butcher names. You mean my theme and continuing to try to be a perfect name pronouncer come on man you're so good let me at least like have something to make fun of you about all right you're the ultimate hype guy (laughs) and and i love to be made fun of by the way Lori day welcome to the show going from the bike to the run will feel like you're running in slow motion good to know good to Mm -hmm. know since it's been clear that i don't have experience in this so i'm glad that you're setting the expectation stevie b is in the house stevie b good to have you back who else do we have in here? Mal Washington. He's in the house. Local hey, Mal's local great celebrity tennis great Mal Washington. He's saying go blue. I can get behind that. I'm into I'm into the Wolverines, even though they always destroy the Gators every time that we uh every time that we play. I still feel it's a a, a university we have a kinship with. Great student body, good public education. Can't can't complain there. So all right, let's get it going. GC. GC, do we have any do we have any updates today? Or are we going straight into the property? Um, I don't know. I don't have any updates right off the top of my head. Um, you know, one thing we didn't talk about, uh, last week on the show and we didn't even get a question about it. It's interesting because, uh, as, uh, COVID came upon us and it affected all aspects of the world and especially, uh, rental property investing. We talked a lot about this eviction moratorium that was in place. Um, and then the eviction moratorium is no more and not even a peep, not even a question. And uh, we didn't bring it up as a, uh, as a beep, 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 you know, breaking news alert because we had so many last week. But that's, that's the reality. If, if folks haven't heard by now, um, the Supreme Court uh, did away with the eviction moratorium. We have, what we have done internally have, has been to proceed as normal with all, all the normal steps that we would take for uh, an eviction that needed to be had. Uh, that is the, the, the direction. So it's all systems go in terms of th- 
that um, internally. The reason why I'm hesitating a little bit is because there is so much new stuff going on in the legal process right now that I'm not sure exactly how all of the evictions will be completed. Um, if we take a step back, JWB was able to process, start and process evictions, basically get it to the, you know, get it to the 10 yard line uh, for those residents that did, uh, you know, fall into that unfortunate circumstance where an eviction was necessary. We, we got it to the 90 or to the, to the 10 yard line um, while there was a motor moratorium in place. Now we're able to proceed all the way through in theory. However, the, there's just not a lot of clarity on to what that actually means. Um, all of the writs of possession across all of the, uh, you know, folks that are going through eviction at this point in time right now, I don't know how those get processed. So that's the latest and greatest internally. We're doing everything that we can be doing to move forward with those um, finalized, completed evictions for those of residents that, that are in that situation. However, I'm just not sure that it's actually going to come through to fruition immediately. I would imagine there's going to be delays. Um, but overall, again, we've talked about this asset class being one where you're investing in, um, you know, not just for the highs, right? You're investing for the lows, like mitigating the lows, right? Mitigating risk, right? Through the eviction moratorium, we collected 98% of rents. Um, at last check, there were only 23 residents that uh, were affected by this eviction moratorium and hadn't paid rent on a, out of a portfolio of over 4,100. So a very small percentage. And now with the eviction moratorium being no moss, we're able to move full steam ahead um, and just get back to normalcy uh, when it comes to the property management business. So um, that, is, that is definitely a good thing for those investors that were affected. Uh, and we're gonna continue to try to serve residents uh, as well as we can to try to come up with solutions. But at the end of the day, it's important to know that eviction is there if it can't be remedied um, and they do need to find a new place. I got some questions, Greg, because I am one of those residents, right? I, I, am, I am one of those property owners. And does, so the eviction moratorium is over. <clears throat> Does this mean that people that signed the CDC attestation, now they're going back into being able to be evicted? Or is the CDC attestation a different thing, right? Because we described this whole kind of process before. You know, it's a, so in theory, uh, it would, the CDC attestation does not matter anymore. So the simple answer to your question is the special rules that we had in place to protect those from eviction who had signed a CDC attestation that protection is no longer in place. That's what the moratorium being done has now allowed. Um, there's a, I'm not 100% certain on what that means. Like for example, um, I'm not 100% certain for those that have signed that attestation, I am hearing some potential delays between before when you can actually proceed with the eviction. Like for example, some notifications are required. Um, again, this is not, I'm just not sure. I've talked with our legal team. They're not sure. Gotcha. Right. So like, it could be that there might be a delay before somebody who signed the CDC attestation, you could actually proceed with the eviction versus if they had not signed that attestation, then it would just be a normal eviction process that may be on the table. Um, I'm not a hundred percent certain on that. I don't think anybody is. The only way you're really going to know is we're going to check back in a month and I'm okay. going to tell you about how many evictions actually came through that were, you know, on waiting for the sheriff to, to issue the writ of possession. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, just to give the, just to give the mindset of the, of the consumer that I would love to just kind of echo, because I, I do play the consumer on this show since I am a, I, I am an investor in JWB as, as well as a super fan of everything you're doing, because I get to see it all. But, you know, we're having this talk, my wife and I are walking the dog and we're just like, all right, so they, they signed this attestation and we're looking around and, and seeing the economy booming, right? And we're seeing that there's like a shortage in jobs and it, 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 there's a shortage in, in labor. And, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense that, you know, that, that whatever, whatever the, whatever the protection is, 
it seems like we're, we're back to work and whether there is going to be some other kind of ramp up, um, it seems fair to say that the, the moratorium can be lifted. So now it's just a matter of the call I got from my portfolio manager was exactly what you just said was, Hey, just so you know, this is what's happening. We now have the lawyers digging into it and we're going to get back to you in a week and tell you, you know, tell you what we've learned. Is that kind of how you're rolling it out? It's, it's, it's weekly updates. Is there a different kind of update that you should expect from your portfolio manager? You know, I, the way that we're handling this is the same way we've handled everything through the moratorium, everything through COVID. It's controlling what we can control, right? What we can control is to continue. If that situation cannot be resolved with that resident, which we do as much as we can to try to come up with solutions that keep that resident in that home and paying rent and all that good stuff. But let's assume that we're beyond that. What we can control is to move forward with the eviction proceedings as quickly and as thoroughly as possible. Um, and that's, that's what we're doing. In theory, it should go all the way to, to eviction and, and the writ of possession, which is when we, we then take possession of the home for you and then get a new resident in place. So, you know, it's just against the backdrop of understanding how information is moving slowly to judges, uh, to legal teams, to property managers, to owners. It's, there's just so much new stuff right now. Um, so what we can control is to continue to push forward as expeditiously as possible. That's what we're doing. And, you know, for your, for your portfolio manager, as far as what you should, you should understand, you know, as an owner of JWB, if you're affected by this, you probably have already been reached out to, and you're going to have a, a communication schedule with your portfolio manager that is right for you. Uh, you know, for you, Pablo, I'm not sure the nature of that conversation, but I would imagine if a weekly status update is important in your specific situation, then we're going to have that specific, you know, update for you. Like for example, right now might be a great time to convert some of those residents who were not paying into a stipulation agreement. You know, a stipulation agreement is a, is a court appointed payment plan, which we love because it, it's a way for the owner to get paid back. And it's also a, re, a way for the resident to stay in the home. You know, of course, if, if they meet our certain qualifications. So if, if, you know, your communication, Pablo, is, hey, listen, we're going to proceed with the eviction. We should be hearing back next Wednesday whether or not the resident would like to move forward with the stipulation agreement and bring a significant amount of the back rent to us. Well, then we're going to have an update for you next Wednesday or next Thursday or next Friday, right? If it's the other way and we don't have communication with the resident and we're moving forward, then the update might not be in for two weeks or three weeks or whatever the communication would be for your, your portfolio manager. Cool. Makes a lot of sense, man. Uh, something I can control is the roll call update. Welcome, Carl Thompson. Good to have you back. Welcome, Danette Col. Man, I'm so I'm so insecure. Danette Colvin. <laughs> Good afternoon to you. Ah, Hervé, I have been shocked to my core, my friend. I, I I feel so terrible about mispronouncing your name for so long. John Hanning, welcome back. Easy name. That's a that's a that's a knock it out of the park T-ball one right there. All right, we got a couple of really good questions already in the Q and A. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tee those up. I want everybody to go to jwbinventory.com right now so that you can download the property sheet because we're gonna dive into that once we. <laughs> oh man, Hervé's telling me I destroyed his name. I'm so sorry, man. All right, so um, we I want you to go to jwbinventory.com so you can download the sheet that we're about to dive into. But right now we're gonna hit a little Q and A because I want everybody asking whatever question you have. We're gonna ask. Ask GC about it. Stevie B asks, JWB recommends holding for a full life cycle, but if growth continues as it has recently for the near future, would JWB endorse shortening the life cycle for profit taking? Or is JWB still bullish on this recent growth to continue for another 10 to 20 years? Well, I'm going to endorse whatever I believe is in the best interest of your returns. Uh, no matter what is said out there or no matter what has proven to be right three years ago or five years ago, my commitment to you is to treat your money like it's my money and to be committed to the best return on investment for you. You know, the, the question of whether you could expect me to change to more of a short-term profit-taking strategy versus the long haul, um, you're probably not going to see that just because I'm, you know, I am in this zone of trying to understand where can I best put my money uh, in a consistent passive manner um, and maximize my return on investment. And you know, no matter what the market does this year or last year, 
what has been proven over full market cycles as the best way to mitigate your risk and to increase your return on investment is to hold on for that full market cycle, right? If you get into this game of like trying to time the market, uh, you know, that's where a lot of people lose in stock markets, where a lot of people lose in real estate, you know, and I just don't, I don't play that game, right? Um, you know, like, for example, if, if you were going to, you know, if we were going to look at a property that you had earned a large amount of appreciation on today and say, well, Greg, should I take that money? Should I sell that property and then put that into another property? My first question would be, uh, where are you going to put it? And if you say, well, I love the Jacksonville market, then I'd say it doesn't make sense to sell one Jacksonville property that you bought at market value that then appreciated for you to go and buy another property because that property also appreciated, right? And your interest rates today are going to be lower than what they are in a year or two from now. So like, even though you take the profit and then you've got to pay taxes on that most likely, right? And you don't get the full benefit of principal pay down. And, and so like, all of your five profit centers are either neutral or less than if you held onto that same property for the next market cycle and, and enjoyed more of those five profit centers. So like that wouldn't make sense. If you were like, well, should I sell this property after I made a nice gain after one year in Jacksonville and I might go to another market, I'd say, well, let's look at what the dynamics are of that market. Right. I don't know of another market that has 27% lower home prices than the U.S. median, that has 0.3% higher rents than the U.S. median, and that has 34% more home price appreciation on average over the last one and a half market cycles, um, like Jacksonville does. So if you're going to go to a market like a Memphis or a Kansas City, I'm going to point to, well, listen, you know, you, you might get more cash flow there. Maybe, maybe not. You're not going to have the team most likely that you have confidence in like you do at JWB. But the biggest thing is if you hold on to that one for the next 10 or 20 years, you're only going to get two and a half percent appreciation each year on average versus 4.3% in Jacksonville. I'd say, well, you're probably losing there too. You know, so all roads for me lead right back to buying and holding with the best team, right? Because then that makes it passive for you and it mitigates your risk in a market that gives you both cash flow and home price appreciation, as well as the other profit centers. And all of that leads back to Jacksonville for me and holding on for a full market cycle is how you maximize those five profit centers. So I'm committed to, to doing whatever is in your best interest, but I think it'll be highly unlikely that you'll see me switch course and say, I think your best move is to sell just to take your profit today. Um, because I just, I don't do that with my own money. And I don't, I don't see how that would benefit you. Yeah. And this is all from the context of a long-term investment and getting returns and low risk reward, right? Like the idea of selling something, for example, if I had some other overlying, you know, Another incentive to use that money for something completely different, be it, I just want to buy a big house for me and my family. So I, I need to cash out some stuff and, and, and this is for me to live, but it's not an investment, right? Like it's a liability uh, or, or something else, right? Like, or you have a, a life situation and you think that you're going to need the liquidity of all that cash flow, then maybe that's right. But then there's even other kind of ways to look at it in a sense like, can you just take a home line of credit, uh, a home equity line of credit to use that liquidity, right, Greg? Like you're talking yeah. from the from the perspective of this money is my long-term investment and that I want the most returns on over the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, you're right. And I'm also thinking of the perspective, not only is it the, the best risk adjusted return on investment, I'm also coming from the sphere of like, you're, you're deciding between rental property investing, you know, how can I maximize your return on rental property investing? Well, it's by buying and holding for a full market cycle. So you maximize all five profit centers. So I'm probably not going to shift from that uh, because the data is so clear that over a full market cycle, that's, that's how you win. Now, if we're, if we're expanding beyond this, right, are there other assets that may make sense for you to sell this property today and invest in another asset class that might have more risk? but higher returns, Correct. then yeah, that might be a great thing for you. Yeah. And I could certainly get behind that. 
right? Let's say that you hit it big and you have more money than you know what to do with. And it's like your investment choices are now like going to the blackjack table um, where it's, you know, high risk, high reward. Well, then maybe go to Bitcoin, right? And maybe that's it, right? It could be the other way. Maybe you're nearing retirement and you, you know, need, I, I don't know, you, you need ultimate security in your uh, wealth. And so you want to put it in CDs and you tell me, listen, I know that I'm earning less than inflation, but I just care this much about preservation of wealth that I'm going to put it in bank CDs. Maybe that makes sense, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Hard for, harder for me to get behind that one, but yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah. saying if your, if your goals change, if your goals dictate and, and the level of risk and reward change for you, then then sure that you might hear me say, hey, listen, I think this could be better suited for you. In fact, that's what my team does. When we have a planning call with all new clients and current clients that come on board, every year at least we're sitting down and we're saying, hey, what's changed with your plan? Yeah. What's changed with your goals? What's changed with your resources? Um, so that might be a reason to, to yeah. sell in the short run. That, that's what I wanted to get at, right? Because I knew you were thinking about it from rental income property, right? Like if, if, if all of a sudden one of your houses, you, you, know, you, you have the opportunity to invest in a company's IPO and you're just like, man, I want to ride this thing. Or you're just like, man, I just want a yacht. <laughs> you know, like at the end of the day, you're either, you're either going to buy something with more risk and potentially more return, or you're going to buy a liability that is an emotional decision of something that you want because you want to live a, a, a certain lifestyle. But as a long-term investor, you're probably not going to change that. That's, that's what I think. But keep tuning in the show, Stevie B. Keep being such a great active contributor to the show. You know, you never know. All right. We got another question from a name that I definitely know how to pronounce because I have been to France. And it is from Anonymous Attende asks, hi, thanks for the information. <laughs> Can you please cover what all an owner ex- an owner needs to track expenses and maintenance for a tax purpose. Does JWB help with accounting or taxes? Is this a topic which needs more time? Can we have one of the days dedicated for this, please? So Anonymous, uh, we do have a show that we have actually gone through uh, the that experience and, and what JWB does. Greg, I think you can illuminate on it. And if you want to send us a... Uh, you know, a message, if you're in the chat and you just hit host and panelists, and so we can see your name, we can make sure to get you that piece of content that the, the show that we went over the owner dashboard and all those things, we can send it to you. And at the end of the day, this is a live thing. We want suggestions from the audience. So if it's time for us to do another show where we talk about that, that experience, we'll be happy to throw that into the schedule. Yeah. Um, I think this is, there's probably three parts to the answer that I think probably matter to uh, anonymous attende out there. Um, with a m, an, an m, m, anonymous. Okay, oui. got it. Oui. Just want to make sure. Thank you for the help on the pronunciation. You, you crush it. Um, <laughs> the, um, the first answer on the simplest one is do we help with accounting? Yes, it's called a Schedule E. So every year, every JWB client gets a Schedule E, which is a, a breakdown of all of the important tax related items related to your rental property. And you get to get this document and you get to hand it right to your CPA or you get to use it yourself if you do your own taxes or, and what have you. So that is, a, is an absolute yes, that goes along with this complete passive experience uh, that we are trying to create for you. And so you can count on that. Uh, the next part would be the, the owner portal that that Pablo kind of referenced there, right? You want to be able to see what your maintenance costs are and have transparency into the costs um, at a moment's notice. So we have our owner portal and it would be great to, if you could share your information with us, because then we can actually show you that breakdown of how we, we went through the owner portal there. That's where that's, that's where all the transactions. Like, um, you know, when you have a maintenance item that comes up, if you're a client of JWB, you already know this, but you basically give us the authority to act on your behalf up to a $400 threshold for your portfolio. So if there's a $50 charge, we're not waiting to call you to get your approval on that. You basically trust us. You have done your due diligence. You trust us that we can act on your behalf. We go ahead. We incur that charge for you. Uh, we get the work done to make sure your resident is happy. And then that charge shows up on your owner, owner portal um, in real time. And there's um, more 
information there. So you, you just kind of know. So that's how you kind of see transactionally how things are going as a client of JWB. And then one step farther is what's called our client ROI report. So that's really important because you need to take the transactional data and you need to relate it to your overall return on investment goals. And this client ROI report that we have, something no other turnkey company that I've ever seen has. I have yet to see it, but it is critical to accomplishing your goals and to holding us accountable to hitting those goals. So on that client ROI report, you'll see your purchase price. You'll see your rental income. You'll see your property taxes, your insurance costs, your maintenance costs, uh, property management fees. Um, any fee that hits your cash flow is going to show there, and we show it every single month. So you're able to see month over month, year over year, how have we been performing? How can you hold us accountable to that? No other property management company is going to have that, by the way. Um, so that's really critical for you to be steering the ship of, you know, steering your own ship of your own financial wealth in a positive direction. That gives you the tool. You can log into that on a monthly basis. Well, you can log in whenever you want, but on a monthly basis, those numbers are updated and you're able to see, okay, Greg, like for example, this property here on Shelby Avenue, it has a 7.33% estimated return on investment. Well, that number doesn't change. And you get to talk to your portfolio manager here at JWB one year, three years, five years from now, and we're going to have a report there. And hopefully that report shows that we produced 7.5 or 8%. But if you produce 6%, you're going to see it. And that is an incredible accountability tool. Boom. Oh, there you go. So the short answer is yes, they help a ton. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Standard. I hope everybody's gone to jwbinventory.com. You've had plenty of time to download the sheet and fiddle with it alongside with us. And you, I will make you wait no more before I magically whisk us away to 4587 Shelby Avenue, Jacksonville, Florida, 32210, purchase price of $215,000. It's a three bedroom, two bathroom house. I am reading this for our friends in the future that are listening on the podcast, by the way. If you don't know, this isn't just a live show. We're a podcast too. We would love for you to share that with your friends if they can't make it on a Tuesday or Thursday. Um, but we make it as easy as possible. If you go anywhere, not your average investor show on YouTube or on podcast platform, you'll find it. So we're here at this beautiful home that is under construction right now. So we have a future picture of it. The lease is for two or three years for $1,300. And what we always like to talk about here on the show, because this is really what you're buying. It's not this picture. It's this cash flow right here, this estimated conventional financing total monthly cash flow of $109 and an estimated conventional financing total ROI of 7.33%. GC, tell me about this monthly cash flow. Monthly cash flow is all about risk mitigation, right? If we go back to the earlier conversation, the way you win in rental property investing is you buy and hold for a full market cycle. A full market cycle is 10 to 20 years. Guess what? That's a long time, but you need to be in the game that long if you're going to maximize your five profit centers. So the way that you stay in the game that long is you make sure you buy assets that pay for themselves every single month. Paying for themselves every single month is critical. That's, an, that's the simplest definition for me of an asset. Does it pay you every single month? That's an asset. Do you have to pay a monthly payment every single month or are there more expenses than income? Well, that's a liability. So you want to be able to know if you're investing in an asset, the easiest way is to look at that total monthly cash flow number. So when you see $109 a month, what that should also represent to you is that now this asset class is scalable. Scalable is really important because most of the time you are not going to accomplish your passive monthly income goal with rental property investing by owning one property or maybe even two. Many times it takes three or five or more, depending on what your goal is. And if you have an a liability every month. If you have to spend $100 negative every single month because you have more expenses than income, like you would if you were investing in properties like in California or New York or Virginia or any of these high priced markets, you're investing in liabilities, right? They, they have more expenses than revenue than, than income every single month. You're putting yourself at risk. So you're not mitigating risk. Um, and you're also not scalable because you're not going to you're not going to want to put 10 of those in your portfolio, right? You're not going to want to go thousands of dollars in the hole every single month. Um, so when you see $109 estimated total monthly cash flow here, think risk mitigation. Is this paying for itself? And then think scalability. Now, 
when you buy these things, they're going to put a hundred bucks in your pocket every single month. Well, that's great, right? hundred bucks isn't going to change your life, but what happens is it allows you to stay in the game for a full market cycle, at which point it will change your life, right? Holding for 10 to 20 years on a relatively small portfolio of assets can absolutely change your life. Got it. So this is risk mitigation. This is the definition of having an asset over a liability is the positive monthly cash flow with a little bit of spread. It's not the end all be all. And at the end of the day, what is going to end up happening is that this monthly cash flow in time will become this monthly cash flow. So when you are reverse engineering kind of where you need to be in 15, 20, 30 years, full market cycles, uh, you are thinking about how many of these kind of like cash monsters you can be producing as well as all the other things. So then $109 typical monthly experience. What is the difference between that and this total ROI? So while I, I kind of, you know, I talk about the importance of total monthly cash flow, but I also make a statement like it's hundred dollars. Isn't going to change your life. Both of those things are, are really critical. Let me show you what, what will change your life in real numbers. If you make decisions like this early and often, right? This total monthly return on investment is uh, something that um, we should spend a little bit more time on because this is what made me fall in love with rental property investing. All right. So your total return on investment is how hard is your money working for you? If you're going to be financially uh, savvy and well off, your money needs to work really, really hard for you. Well, the, the greatest way to measure that is what's your return on investment, right? So 7.33% estimated. What that takes into account is all of the good things that happen uh, for your rental property, including some additional profit centers, like tax savings and principal pay down. It takes those good things, right? It takes tax savings, principal pay down, net rental income, it takes all those good things. It also takes into account the negative items that are going to happen at some point along the way. Those negative items would be maintenance cost, vacancy cost, tenant placement fees, um, other items like closing costs. All of these things are largely left off of most rental property evaluations by new and experienced investors. That's where they fail to put the right property valuation together, but you got to include that. So you take all the good things, the additional profit centers, you also take into account the negative items, the maintenance costs, the vacancy costs, the tenant placement fees. Um, and you put all that together and you divide it by what your initial investment is. And that's how you get to an estimated return of 7.33%. Um, but I still haven't shown you what was going to change your life. <laughs> because investing for 10 or 20 years and earning 7.33% returns is wonderful. You can largely do that in the stock market, right? And many other investments out here. If I had only seen an opportunity to earn 7.33% returns in rental property investing, I would not have quit my career at Johnson & Johnson and uh, put all of my, taken all of the risk and put what little money I had at the time to jump into rental property investing and taking on all of that debt to jump into rental property. I had to see more. And the more that it's not showing right here is the increase in return on investment from home price appreciation. That's not included in the 7.33% returns, but I think we jump into that right now, Pablo. What do you think? I say we jump right in, man, both feet. Talk to me. Okay. So uh, what you're seeing that 7.33%, that's largely the things that we can control as your property manager, as your asset manager, really, um, we can control there. Now, if you're going to hold on for a full market cycle, if you followed my advice, then you can actually count on home price appreciation. And you actually have a pretty good idea of what it's going to be in your market. In Jacksonville, you go and look back, it's 4.3% appreciation on average year over year. Well, how did I get that number? It's because I went and did the research to see since 1991, what has our market appreciated on average year over year. And they also know how supply and demand and market cycles work. You know, by definition, a market cycle means that it repeats itself every so often. Well, that means that home price appreciation tends to repeat itself over 10 to 20 year segments of time. So if you know that you're going to be investing for a long time, 10 to 20 years, and you also know historically what the average appreciation rate is for your market, then you can assume that you're going to get largely the same type of appreciation each year if you hold on for a full market cycle. In Jacksonville, I mentioned it's 4.3%. When you do this and you couple it with smart debt, 
this is what can change your life as a rental property investor, investor in general. So let's go there. We put 4.3% into the appreciation rate calculation there, Pablo. And let's change lives. Work your, work your magic. Boom, changing lives. There you go. And it's a little bit blurry there, Pablo. Why don't you zoom in just a little bit so we can see how many lives are, are being changed <laughs> at, at this very, very moment, right? <laughs> I love this. Yeah, man. So listen, I put 4.3%. I press enter. You can do this at home if you download the sheet and fiddle with it alongside us. But what you see is this thing going from 7.0% to 22.96% when you just add the 4.3% appreciation rate. And this is what GC is talking about. Why don't you, why don't you explain the 16% jump here, man? So this is the beauty of investing in assets that go up in value over the long haul and using other people's money in a smart way, not in a super risky way, in a smart way. Because when you invest in rental properties, you only have to put, let's say 20% down or 25% down. But when the market value goes up 4% every single year, your return on investment from that appreciation is not 4%. Right? If you put 25% down and the market value of your property goes up 4% that year, that's actually a 16% return on investment just from the home price appreciation. And that's what you're seeing here. Once I finally kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together for that, I couldn't wait to go out and take on more debt so that I could go and buy rental properties. That's why at 23 years old, I went and acquired 40 rental properties with my business partners. We were snot-nosed kids, didn't come from money, but I got, I, I got really excited figuring out how could I acquire these assets. It's because I realized that, well, if I was in my 20s and in my 30s, and I could just build up an army of assets that were producing 20% returns that also mitigated risk, they paid for themselves every single month, right? Number one, total monthly cash flow. Does it pay for itself? It did that. And then I could still stack up 20% performing assets year over year over year, that's how I could control my time. That's how I can enjoy financial freedom as I was getting closer to 40, right? That's, that's what made me jump into this. And I'm not a risk, I'm not a risk taker. I'm a conservative guy. So, so there you go. It's that 16% return on investment is what you've created. Even if the market just performs like it has normally, like I'm not talking about a market like over the last year to this year, which has seen 15 to 20% appreciation. I'm taking whatever appreciation number it has been and multiplying it times four because you're using smart debt. Right? If, we've, if we've seen 15% appreciation and you bought a property last year and it went up 15% and you used smart debt, that's actually a 60% return on investment just from the home price appreciation. Right? That's real. Yeah, that's that's real. what people have experienced here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that's going to happen next year. I'm not saying it's going to happen in the future. I don't even make decisions based on that. Actually, I'm not planning on that happening. But I just want to you know, show how powerful it is if you can master smart debt and assets that pay for themselves, pay for themselves every single month. This is, how, this is how it can change your life right there. Yeah, that's a real life changer, man. And that, uh, that definitely changed my life in understanding that piece, which is why I love it when we harp on this. Um, in, in on the show, right? Because that understanding of the leverage piece as a semi-educated person <laughs> that understands markets and I understand ROI and I know math, but I, you know, when I talk to, when I talk to my buddies that are smartest guy in the room, lawyer that, you know, is offered syndication deals and like IPOs and how, how do I put some money into a, um, you know, like venture capital deal, they aren't, thinking about this. Stuff. They're not thinking of, oh, wait a minute. This is the only place where I get to put in 25 and I get credit for a hundred um, on the ROI piece. So I think it's really, really big that, that, that we hit on this. And I love how you explain it, GC. All right, man, we got some, we got some good questions for you. Ready? Let's do it. We're going to, I'm going to put a pin on Stevie B has some real good context for that first question that he, that he asked about, and I want to get to it. So let's, Let's see if we can hammer through these ones real quick and we can have a longer discussion to Stevie B's question. So, all right. Hey, Pablo, let's, let's stop the screen share too because it still looks a little bit blurry for me. All right, cool. Um, Raj Bantu asks, what percentage of new single family homes have city water and sewer? 
Oh man, I don't have a percentage right off the top of my head. Um, you know, I, there's a lot, I, man, if you had to nail me down, I wouldn't say more have sewer and more have septic. Um, if you think about why JWB is able to, um, to be really good at new construction, it's because we go in and we build on lots that no other builder wants to be able to build on because most builders want to go in and fully develop a neighborhood and build a hundred homes at one time. And they don't want the infill lots. Well, we have carved out our niche. We're the biggest infill builder in Jacksonville. And that means that we go into existing neighborhoods and then we build on those lots that are right in between other houses that may have been there for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So, and, and in Jacksonville, there's a lot of Jacksonville that does not have city water and sewer, right? So, you know, and many of our neighborhoods do not have city water and sewer. So we have gone in and we, of course, build on those infill lots and a lot of them will have septic. This home here on Shelby is a great example. That's a perfect segue, right? This one has, um, has a performance-based septic system. It's another really good example. And many people don't know what a performance-based septic system is, right? This is technology that allows you to uh, be able to build a house on a relatively small lot and have a septic system that can serve that house. Normally, you have certain lot requirements for a conventional septic system. So we realized early on at JWB that our niche was going to be infill builds and these are rental properties. They don't need huge land, right? It's a rental property. So if we're going to be doing this and if the neighborhood doesn't have city water and sewer, then we need to have a solution to do this. So we, of course, uh, have I've, uh, done a lot of home, built a lot of homes with this special technology called performance-based septic systems. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, we, I would say, man, I couldn't even say more city water and sewer, more with septic. Um, and we love them both uh, because, you know, they performed well for clients. And again, you know, and, and one of the things I was going to talk about, this is a perfect segue, is when we do have septic systems, for all new systems that are put in, whether this is a new construction home or whether it's a renovation for any JWB client, uh, you get the septic warranty program now. And it's the best type of warranty because it covers your, uh, if there would be a, a major problem with your system, then it's going to be covered under warranty. It's the best warranty because you don't have to pay for it. It is a part of your residence fees to be able to pay um, the premium for the warranty for your septic system, which is, which is great. And it fits right in line with their cost structure because they don't have city uh, water and sewer fees that they typically would have if they were on city water and sewer. So it fits perfectly in line with with their payment structure as well. So long answer again, that's kind of what I do. I'm known as a talker. So there you go. <laughs> I could have sworn right before this, I said, let's hammer through these, but you did well, GC, because you also answered Lee's question, who was going to ask about the septic, who, who, who said this would be a good time to bring up the septic insurance. So, right. well, well done, man. Well done. You did better than you thought. All right. And then Musa Tunde, he's back or she's back. And uh, the question is, is the turn cost you mentioned about 4K plus included in the projections? The turn K that I mentioned, the turn cost Are, of 4K plus. Is, is the cost of turning the property included yes. in this sheet's projections? Yes. Simple answer is yes, it is included in that uh, maintenance percentage. Uh, I don't remember mentioning 4K, but the maintenance cost is 4% of the gross rents that are collected each year. And so um, if you're thinking about how much on average you should plan to spend on maintenance, 4% of the rents that you earn every single year historically is what we have performed at for JWB. And yes, that includes the small maintenance items that may happen while your resident's living in the home. And it also includes the property turn cost. It also includes CapEx items, which might, might be your roof or AC. It's all included in that maintenance number. That's right. And real quick, uh, Anonymous. If you go to the sheet, right? Like we were in this summary sheet. If you switch to that third, this part that says analysis and, convent and, and conventional financing or any of the other uh, sheets that you have here, you see that about every so often there is a tenant placement fee and then there is elevated, you know, other costs that have to do with those turn fees. So that is how you can dig deeper into the numbers if you want to go to jwbinventory.com and download it yourself and fiddle. 
So Anonymous has another question. Do you recommend switching to city sewer if they open up service in that area? I mean, that's a, it's, you're typically not going to change from a septic system that is performing well, that has a resident that's performing well, and then make the switch to city water and sewer, like at that, you're, you're typically not going to make that switch at that exact moment in time. Um, there's ways to coordinate it. Once the city water and sewer opens up, then you can, we can coordinate when the best time for you to switch over city water and sewer uh, may be. And the other really great thing about Jacksonville is we just uh, had a new gas tax uh, uh, approved by city council. Uh, I think it's $930 million that's going into infrastructure. And one of the biggest projects is to bring more city water and sewer to more neighborhoods in Jacksonville. So that might become more and more of a reality in some of the neighborhoods that we're in. Uh, so, but yeah, it's a great question. That's why you have a dedicated portfolio manager here who's going to know your portfolio. Um, we, of course, will know if city water and sewer is going in in your neighborhood. We'll know when your resident, you know, if your resident is leaving, if there's a major expense that you just have to incur on your septic tank, well, then that's probably the time to switch over. Um, and we'll, we'll be able to have a coordinated plan for you. All right, there you go. And by the way, you are saying all this advice from the standpoint of maximizing your long-term ROI, right? So these are all data points that you have decreed that, you know, based on maximum long-term ROI, switching over to city sewer should happen at a certain moment in time that decreases the initial cost in order to increase the ROI, right? Yeah, you know, it used to be, you used to have more of a, a risk of city, excuse me, being on septic than you do today before our septic warranty program, right? Because if you have a septic tank that blows or the drain field is no longer functional, that could be a six, eight, $10,000 expense, you know? And so you would want to get onto city sewer for, you know, to avoid that potential risk of that happening at some point, right? Now, what we're talking about here is, a new construction property. So we've always, you know, it's not like drain fields blow often, but previously, if you were on a septic tank and you had the opportunity to be on city water and sewer, you'd want to be on city water and sewer because you don't have the risk of that septic tank um, blowing. Now that risk has been mitigated because now our septic warranty program covers that loss of the drain field not functioning or the septic system blowing. Um, and that is covered. So that risk is not there for the owner, for the client who purchases this house on Shelby, uh, which we were just talking about the property of the week today, you don't have that risk because the, the warranty vendor of course, earns a premium that's paid by your resident and your septic system is protected, uh, from that type of loss. All right. I want to get into Steve B's question. I also feel guilty that my good buddy, Irve, and I've been messing up his name forever has a question and I want to just throw it up there for you, knock it out, and then let's dive into Stevie B's. Hervé, great question, buddy. We're friends. Asks, when developing a new build on an infill lot, what is the typical price range between the newly built JWB home versus the existing homes that anchor that newly built JWB home? Let me know if you need me to clarify. I think what he's asking is there a premium for our houses versus renovated homes that are in the same neighborhood? And the answer is maybe a little bit, but all of our properties are priced to sell based on what other homes have sold in the neighborhood. And so generally speaking, right, there are new construction homes that are selling in that neighborhood and there are older homes that are selling in that neighborhood. And it's unique that we would be the only new construction house across all renovated homes that are selling. Um, so there's a slight premium for new construction versus renovation, but everything is based on what has recently sold. And so the majority of the time, you'll have a handful of new construction comps that have sold in the neighborhood, just like your new construction property would be. And you'll also have some renovated comps that would be slightly priced slightly lower. That's in a normal market. Now, in this market, as we've just talked about, year over year, pricing has gone up 15 to 20%. So it's less about new construction versus renovation. It's more about what just sold. <laughs> what was the most recent sale, uh, regardless of new construction or renovation? That's just the state of the market today. So 
Cool. That go. makes sense. All right. Let's dive into Stevie B's question. He's got some great context. All right. Hervé Ur- says, Pablo, beautiful job on the pronunciation. I now forgive you. Yes. All right. My day can now continue. This works. Stevie B, he asks, let me uh, pull it up. All right. His situation is a little bit different from what he asked earlier, right? To, rem- to remind everybody, Stevie B had asked, is it time to sell and cash out on a property now that price has gone so far up? So here's some context. Today's question. His situation is a little bit different because his properties are in a solo K, right? Solo 401k. They're done with non-recourse financing. That means that he doesn't participate in all the five profit centers just pay down and appreciation. So he's also looking to retire within the next 10 years and income is paramount. For example, if he sells two of his properties and then retires, he nets 400K and can get 40K a year from private money lending. So if he compares that to what he can get from rentals, again, not participating in the five profit centers, it seems like that might be the way to go. Is he missing anything there? Great question, Stevie B. Thank you so much for for being a part of this community and for asking that question. Um, What I'm understanding is that you have experienced significant gains by owning the rental properties in your solo 401k, and you're wondering if you should convert that into private lending because you need that recurring income. Um, And, you know, if you own the rental properties in your retirement accounts, your, your ceiling is much higher than what you would get from private lending, but the consistency of the income is not as much, right? So I could certainly see where it would make sense for you to sell your properties that are in your solo 401k and convert to private lending if, if that was what, uh, you know, it, that could be a, a, a very good thing. But I want to make a couple of, I have a couple of questions. Um, because you got to realize that the reason that you have earned so much is because you were investing in the hard asset that went up over time, right? Like if you own the, if the asset went up 15% year over year last year for home price appreciation, and you had a loan in place for 50% down, right? You take that appreciation rate times two, you earn 30% on the home price appreciation, you know? Um, and you do have the ability to earn consistent income while it's in your solo 401k. And we do expect prices to continue to go up in the future. So if you want to continue to have that high ceiling, there's probably ways where you could hold on to the asset and accomplish your income goals. Um, Like for example, you could, we could have an accelerated debt pay down strategy for you to pay off one of the assets, uh, which would free up the cash flow and maybe reach that that um, cash flow goal for you while also having the ability to, um, you know, enjoy the higher profit centers by holding the asset. But if that's not the case, if you can't accomplish what your income goal was through some effective debt pay down, um, what you in fact would be doing is kind of cashing in your chips a little bit to just get consistency of income in private lending. And that might also be the, the, the great, a great play there. But when you do that, you earn 10%. From JWB, right, or somewhere around there for other, you know, private lending opportunities. If the market value goes up another ten percent next year, let's just say, and you had held that asset where you only put fifty percent down, you could have earned over twenty percent returns if you had held the asset, but you only earned ten percent for the private lending. So. My advice would be to first look, especially because we see where the market is today, and we expect to have higher than normal home price appreciation in the coming years. My first advice would be to look and see and work with my team to see if we can accomplish your passive income goal while you still own the asset. If that can't be accomplished, then going to private lending, selling and transferring that to private lending um, would be the next best option, in my opinion. To clarify something that you just hit on, right? Two things, because you said it kind of funny at the beginning of like, uh, consistency, not so much, right? It's this idea that holding the home inside of your 401k, that income coming from rent, you know, if a, if a tenant leaves for a month or two months, or there's an eviction process that could decrease the consistency 
while when you're in private money lending, that's like in a bank, it's coming every single month. So there is a, a level of consistency that depending on the risk profile may vary. And man, I forgot what the other one was. And that was the really the one that I wanted to get to. So you were talking about uh, holding, oh yeah. You talk about 4.3% appreciation in the long-term as what your long-term strategy is. Right now, in the short term, you make decisions based on data that is months of inventory. And months of inventory right now in the short term is super, super low, meaning that you are pretty certain that at least in the short term, months of inventory is going to drive that rate of appreciation of a home significantly higher than 4.3%. Is there, is there a time where Stevie B should look at of, oh, okay, months of inventory, right, right now. So to give scope of the equation, right? Equilibrium for months of inventory that we talk about in the past of the show is about seven months, right? Six and to that, seven months. And that means 4.3% home price appreciation. Right now it's like one month. Right. And what we saw at one month for last year was 20% appreciation. Mm -hmm. So if I was Stevie B, my next question would be, should I then chill until I see months of inventory get to five months? of appreciation? Is that kind of the question that he should be looking at? And, you know, like, I'm just trying to add more context to what Stevie's trying to get here. Yeah. That's what we get into this kind of conversation of trying to like time the market, right? Who here is successful at timing the stock market? Not me. Right. Um, you know, this leading indicator of months of inventory is, is just that it's, it's not foolproof. There's it's one metric that's easy for us to look at and understand across an entire gamut of, of variables that we need to take into account. So I don't think you can start to look and say, well, I should just look at months of inventory and plan to sell at five months of inventory or six months of inventory um, because it just doesn't work that way. Um, you know, I, I think at, if we go back to like the original conversation, which was like, would I ever you know, advise somebody to sell in, in the short run. If the plan is always to invest in single family rental properties, my answer is, you know, I don't think short term. I don't think that that delivers the best return on investment. But if your life goals change, like Stevie B's life goals just changed there, right? Like, for example, you know, originally he bought those properties in his solo 401k and he didn't need the income. Because when you buy properties with financing, you don't need the monthly cash flow. That's not why you do it, because they're about break even. Well, then now his life plans have changed, and that income is the biggest driver for him. Well, then you can always make a different decision, and we can help you, and we can look at the market and analyze that, you know, for kind of like the here and now, and probably like the next, I don't know, six months or so, six to 12 months, right? But when you start to go a little bit farther than that, two years, three years, five years, it really breaks down. Right. I, I don't know what the market's going to do in three years or five years. The, the months of inventory that I'm looking at today can vary wildly over the next three years from now. Right. Right. Home builders are building in mass now. They can't build fast enough. Right. That's going to bring a large supply of inventory on the market at some point. Is it three years from now? Is it five years from now? Is it seven years from now? I don't know. So there's just too many variables to go farther out than probably six months, maybe 12 months when you're looking at months of inventory. Um, so I think for Stevie B, you know, let's look at your personal situation right now. If your goals have changed, if the income is the biggest driver now and it wasn't before, then maybe a change of strategy makes sense for you. If the goal is still to have the best risk adjusted return on investment in single family rental properties, that asset class. I'm, I'm here for the long haul. I think you guys should be in for the long haul, right? You win when you hold on for a full market cycle from all five profit centers in that. There you go. We went deep. That is the type of question we love on the Natural Average Investor Show. When we can go really, really deep into something like that and provide some really, really good context, make it easy for you to get an answer. I want to also illustrate the knowledge that happens inside of our chat as well. Lee Bishop has some takes on it. Keeping the assets would increase your cash flow every year. Keeping up with cost of living increase if you kept the house and the houses are paid off, right? So that's something to think about. It keeps up with cost of living increase. Lydia fills in, a, a, inserts, interest income is considered earned income and taxed as such. 
no tax shelter and may affect your social security taxability as well, right? So a um, couple, couple of things to think about, right? If it, When you're in it, tons of context. I think this is a really quick one for you to see you, Danette, Danette's, Danette's getting out of here. We're going a little deep, but because we, you know, we, we took a little long to get on here. Dean Curry has a real quick question I think that you can answer in under a minute, GC. Is JWB only doing new builds for rentals at this time versus buying existing properties, reba- rehabbing them and selling them to JWB investors? It not only, just a large majority is new construction. Think 90% new construction because of the dynamics in the real estate market right now. Existing inventory is extremely low. There you go. We never take it for granted that we've gone over. We started a little bit late and we've had 30 people on with us this entire time in the middle of a work day. Super, super appreciative. Great questions today. I love the JW Bank of Property of the Week. Wait, 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 wait. Because it really is this time that we get into to interact. We hope that you feel that if you came here for uh, finding out about owning rental properties that you were in the right place. If you found out about property management, you're in the right place. If you found about the, the, the JWB market, you're in the right place. Next step to go to get a question answered deep like that, go to chat with JWB.com, get on the call with the team, just as helpful as Greg, um, you know, varying levels of more attractiveness, but you know, really, really helpful as well. And, uh, you know, I would love to kind of tease what we're doing on Tuesday, GC. We got a, we got a case study of buy versus hold. A hidden 10K in returns is what we're going to be talking about next week on Tuesday at the same time, same channel. What can you tell us about that to give us a little teaser? You know, get this question a lot, right? Why does it make sense to buy and hold? You guys hear me preach from the mountaintops that buying and holding gives you the best risk adjusted returns on investment. It's what I've seen in my own portfolio for over 15 years now. Um, and I'm just, I, I've wanted to put the numbers together for you. I wanted to show you why I'm so committed to buying and holding and why it's proven beyond just our friends here on the Not Your Average Investor Show, why savvy investors for decades and decades and decades have chosen to buy and hold single family rental properties um, because of the five profit centers and how you benefit from it. So we're going to do a little case study, buying uh, and then selling uh, relatively early versus buying and holding for the long haul. And I think you guys will get a ton of value out of it. So can't wait. I can't wait either. I want to thank everybody for showing up. If you haven't joined the Facebook group yet, go to jwbfacebookgroup.com. Hang out with us throughout the week. Hang out with us over the weekend. Watch Greg dominate and spike ball and give great advice. We are going to be talking about more things inside the Facebook group. We want to make it more valuable to you, right? So we realize that we talk a lot about real estate and we talk a lot about Jacksonville. We talk a lot about JWB. We would love to hear in the Facebook group, what other stuff do you want to hear about that has to do with investing, right? Do you want to hear more about crypto? Do you want to hear about e-commerce as passive income, right? Do you want to hear about like, what is it to buy like a website or something like that versus buying real estate? We want to expand the tent so that more people want to come back to the Facebook group and help us grow. We have 3000 people in there right now, super valuable. We want to make it better. We want your friends to show up. So please inside the Facebook group, let us know what is it that brings you back to websites? What else, what other podcasts do you listen to? What blogs do you read? What, um, what, you know, who do you follow? We want to include them inside the conversation to make it more and more valuable for you. GC, this is always my favorite part of the week, man. You killed it today. And I'm going to leave you with last words. Thanks everybody. I appreciate everybody being here. Appreciate you, my friend, another great uh, property of the week in the books here. You guys make it super special. And I hope you all have a really wonderful weekend and we'll catch you next week on the show. See everybody. Right.